Bionicle Legends 3 Power Play Written by Greg Farshty Recording by Lord of the Tree Frogs Chapter 2 My name is Kongu, he said to himself. I come from the tree village of Likoro on the island of Matanui. If I live someplace else before that time era, I don't remember it. His companion stopped walking. He wondered if they were lost. It wasn't like there were many landmarks. None of them knew this strange island anyway, which seemed so much less hospitable than Matanui. Heavy cloud cover made navigating by the stars impossible. My name is Kongu, he repeated. Back home, I was captain of the Goku Bird Force, an ever-skilled bird wrangler. When they told us we had to hurry move to the city of Metronui, I helped build boats for the trip but we didn't stay there long once we got there. The group was on the move again. Someone was pointing toward the volcano at the center of the island. That seemed as good a place as any to start, he reasoned. We went to Metronui because the Taraga elder said we had to, in order to have any hope of quick waking the great spirit, he continued. But when we got there, we found out he wasn't just asleep. He was dying. Our heroes, the Toa Nuva, were sent to this island to seek find something that would save him. When they didn't return, my friend Jaller persuaded a bunch of us to go deep look for them. His thoughts trailed off. The rest of the story was too far-fetched to believe. Their masks had been stolen on the journey and replaced with others that were who knew how ancient. They had stumbled on canisters that transported them to the shores of Oya Nui, but before they could even get out and look around, something had happened. What was it? Kongu wasn't sure. There was a bright light flash, then a feeling that I was surrounded by a thousand Nui-Rama bugs, all buzzing at once. I quick scrambled out of the canister, and there were Holly, Jaller, Matoro, Nuparo, and Yuki, all looking like Toa. From the looks in their eyes, I figured I must look like one too. Somehow, though, he had never imagined being a Toa would feel like this. Sure, he had raw power in his muscles now, and really awesome armor, but almost seemed like he had too much energy, and his mask just felt... weird. We're ever wondering in the dark, he said in as loud a voice he could manage while still whispering. We have no idea where we are, where the Toa heroes are, or what else might be on this island. The others didn't look back. The only sound was their metal-shod feet scraping against the rocks. What's wrong with this carving? Although spoken in a whisper, Kongu's words were like a shout. What do you want us to do? asked Jaller. Turn back? Sit on the beach until morning and talk everything out? No, Kongu replied, trying to keep the irritation out of his voice. I just remember the Taraga's tales of what happens when Toa go off without a plan. He has a point, said Holly. Jaller stopped and turned around. Kongu expected him to keep arguing for moving on, but surprisingly, he did not. You're right, both of you. There was no point in listening to Turagavakama's tales if we aren't going to learn from them. But let's keep this short. The Toa Nuva may need us. Toa Nuparu sat down on a rock. I'll start by taking this Kanohi mask off for a second. I miss my old one. This one just doesn't feel. The area was suddenly lit up with a blinding glare. The other Toa shielded their eyes. Nuparu looked around to see what was causing the bright light, but the only thing he learned was that the illumination was everywhere he looked. What was going on? Put your mask back on! snapped Yuki. Nuparu did as he was told, figuring the new Toa stone must have spotted some danger. As soon as he returned the Kanohi to his face, the light went out. That was strange, he said, his inventor's curiosity piqued. That was your face, answered Yuki. Very funny, said Nuparo. You're no vision of beauty yourself, Yuki. Holly shook her head. He's not joking. When you took off your mask, your face gave off a blinding glow. I couldn't even see your features. Yuki gestured towards a nearby cave. Let's talk in there. No point in lighting up the night and letting everyone else here know our location. The cave was dank and almost too small for all six of them to fit in comfortably. 
Once inside, Holly reached up and removed her mask. Her face, too, gave off an eye-searing radiance. Something's wrong, said Matoro. I saw Toa Kapaka take his mask off once, and nothing like that happened. What kind of Toa are we? I don't know, Holly answered. It seemed very strange to hear her voice coming from inside the glow, but not to be able to see her mouth move. But that's not the only unusual thing here. Take my mask. Tell me what you think. Matoro reached out and took Holly's kanohi from her outstretched hand. He noticed immediately what she was talking about. Unlike any other mask he had ever handled, this one was pliable, less like armor and more like organic tissue. It felt warm to the touch. Suddenly, with a cry, he dropped it on the ground. It moved, he yelled. I mean, I think it moved in my hand. Don't be ridiculous. Masks can't move, said Huki, reaching out to recover the Kanohi. They're objects. They're not. His fingers brushed against the mask. The Kanohi recoiled. Huki pulled back instantly. He looked up at the others and finished weakly. Alive? Put it back on, Holly, said Jaller. I'm not so sure I want to, answered the Toa of Water. She gave a half smile. What if it bites? Do it anyway, said Jaller. I feel like I'm having a conversation with a light stone. Hesitantly, Holly took her mask in hand. It never moved, tried to get away from her, or came across as anything but an inert object. She put it back on, cutting off the glare and allowing the others to lower their hands from their eyes. Well, said Nuparu, I always wondered what it'd be like to become a Toa. Somehow I never pictured blinding features and moving masks. Think we could get a do-over? Jaller abruptly turned to Kongu. What am I thinking? Before the Toa of Air could think of a response, he heard Jaller's voice in his head. He was saying something about a Rahi beast he had fought a long time back. Kongu listened for a few moments and then replied, You were remembering a Mawaka that threatened Takoro three years ago. You and the guard needed two days to drive chase it off. And how did I know that? It's a mask of telepathy, remember? said Jaller. When we found it, Toa Takanuva was able to read Holly's thoughts. It changed like the Matoran mask we were wearing, into this more organic form, but it still works. Despite the mask's strange appearance, I'm willing to bet they work the same as the ones we know. Who knows? Maybe better. Nuparo stood up. Great, but how do we use them? Remember how long it took the Toa Metru to master their mask powers in Tarag of Akama's tale? We have no training in using uh, great masks, and they won't activate just by our saying, I wish my mask worked. No sooner were the words out of Nuparu's mouth than he shot straight up into the air and collided with the cavern roof. He fell back down, stunned. On the other hand, maybe they will, commented Huki. Zaktan, leader of the Paraka, was not happy. The operation on Voya Nui had seemed like it would be a simple one. Get on the island, snatch the Mask of Life from its hiding place, and get off. No mess, little risk, and great reward. It had started to go wrong almost from the beginning. The Paraka had been unable to sustain the fraud that they were Toa here to help the local Matoran. A small group of the villagers rebelled, and time had to be wasted hunting them down. Then six Toa Nuva arrived on the island. They were also seeking the mask, and it took a lengthy combat and the help of Brutaka to stop them. And now there are more here. None of the Paraka were talking openly about what they had seen, but that didn't mean they weren't reviewing the moment in their heads. Those six stars that appeared in the sky were spirit stars. Zaktan was sure of it and each star was bound to a Toa. Apparently, this worthless little island on the south end of nowhere had suddenly become a gathering point for would-be heroes. Add that to the fact that the Paraka themselves were turning on one another. Zaktan had already put down two open rebellions by his team that were bound to be more. Eventually, he might just have to kill one of the other five just to make a point. It would be worth it. Nothing mattered more than getting his hands on the Mask of Life. Let the Matorn burn in the lava. Let the others on his team fall to Toa. And let the rest of Voya Nui sink into the sea, as long as he had that mask. The others didn't understand 
They thought it was just one more Kanohi. Zack Tan knew it was more, although he couldn't put his finger on just how he knew. But each time he closed his eyes to rest, he awoke more certain than ever that that mask was the key to ultimate power. Legend stated that the Mask of Life was forged by the Great Beings long before the coming of Matanui, or the creation of the city of Metronui. It was no exaggeration to say that the life or death of the universe was tied to that mask. Under normal circumstances, it might be donned once every 5,000 years by a Toa whose destiny called for such a sacrifice. For the wearer of that Kanohi, it was said, would burn with the energies it unleashed. These, of course, were not normal circumstances. The great spirit Matanui was comatose and had been so for 1,000 years. Metronui had been abandoned by the Matoran, then reclaimed. Entire cities had been destroyed or else torn from their home continents, as Voyanui had been. Vizarak had ran wild. Rahi was still on the rampage in some areas. The Brotherhood of Makuna was at war with the Dark Hunters, and both sides eliminated any Toa they ran across. Chaos ruled. That explains why the Toa are here, and why they want the mask. They think they can restore order with it. The fools, Zaktan thought. Order is dead and buried. The universe belongs to anyone strong enough to seize the stars and crush them in his grasp. The emerald armored Paraka was reluctant to admit even to himself that he didn't really know exactly what the mask could do. He privately doubted that any one could know he could slay a universe. The legends were probably just that. Legends. Comforting little lies passed down by weak-minded Matoran that were designed to convince the Matoran that all would be well in the end and that there was nothing truly scary lurking in the darkness. Zaktan smiled. It is obvious the tale tellers never met a Paraka. Hakan woke up. His head felt like a Kikanano had been dancing on it. He coughed up some rock dust and decided it was time to try getting up. Shoving aside some rubble, he stood up. He was in the Paraka stronghold where Zaktan had left him. Foolishly, Hakan had calculated the Paraka leader might be ripe for an overthrow and he had acted on his own rather than allying with others. Zaktan had beaten him with embarrassing ease, and then, in a show of complete disrespect, had allowed the rebellious Paraka to live. Hakan took a deep breath and tried to calm himself. Acting from emotion was what had gotten him defeated. He had to be smart. He had to have a plan. Most importantly, he had to get someone else to take the risks next time. Conveniently, three other Paraka, Avak, Redak, and Thok, chose that moment to enter the chamber. Hakan purposely slumped against the wall, trying to look more badly injured than he really was. When they asked him what had happened, he would tell them Zaktan attacked him for no reason and convinced them they would be next. That's what he would have done, anyway. But the three walked right past him with barely a glance, as if a wounded Hakan was something they saw every day, or wished they did. I should throw you off cliffs more often, Redak said to Thok. It's fun! The white-armored Paraka simply glared. Avak stepped in between them, snarling, Shut up and listen! Brutaka beat six to Anuva with one swing of his blade. What happens if he comes after us? I point him at Redak and get out of the way, Thok replied. He got in a lucky shot, Redak said. Took the Toa by surprise. I could have handled him. Like the way you handled Zaktan, Thok growled. We had him caged and you freed him, you idiot. Enough, Hakan shouted. The others turned to look at him, then resumed walking. But the crimson armored Paraka was not going to be denied. You're missing the obvious, he continued. I expect that from Redak, but you, Thok... Where is that cunning brain you're always bragging about? Has it rotted from the heat of Voyanui's lava flows? Shut up, Hakan, said Thok. All right, Hakan replied. Then I guess you don't want to know that Zaktan was conspiring with Brutaka long before you knew he existed. The two of them have a pact, and who else wants to bet it involves five dead Paraka and Zaktan with the Mask of Life? The other three stopped in their tracks. Ordinarily, they wouldn't believe much of anything that came from Hakan's grinning mouth. 
but they also knew what Zaktan was capable of. And if he had a being like Brutaka at his side... Forget this, said Avak. Let's get off this rock. I'd rather take my chances with the Dark Hunters than get snapped in two by Zaktan and his pet monster. I hate to risk leaving Zaktan in control of the Mask of Life, if it exists, said Thok. But unless we can split Brutaka away from him... Are you finished? Hakan said, sounding bored. There will be no splitting. There will be no snapping. Instead, you will listen to me and do exactly what I say. Assuming, of course, you want to live to see another rainy day on Voya Nui. Hakan waited a moment for his words to sink in and then smiled. We can handle Zaktan. Brutaka is the real threat. So we get him before he gets us. And here's how we do it. The other three Paraka listened carefully to the words that followed. By the time Hakan was finished, they were smiling too. End of chapter 2